I'm very excited about our next segment. Uh, our guest is uh, Marina Azamante, who's a professor at Stony Brook University. Uh, and I came about uh, discovering Marina in a, in a very unusual way. Well, not that unusual. I, I read a publication called The Economist, and they were doing a study, not a study, a report, and within the report they were talking about polarization. And as you know, the theme of our television show is why is our political system dysfunctional and why is it polarized? And so, bingo, uh, you know, we have this uh, person who's done a study on polarization. And I contacted Marina, and she was extremely gracious and offered to be on the show. So our, our guest is Marina Azamante. She, as I said, she's a professor at Stony Brook University. But she um, also has worked for the Fed in Philadelphia. And I found that also fascinating. And uh, the Fed is probably in the news as much as uh, Lady Gaga or anybody these days because all the problems we've had with the uh, Great Recession and uh, the economy and uh, easing and not to ease and all these other things. So having someone that had done this scholastic work for the Fed I thought was a really interesting twist. I also told Marina uh, as we were getting ready for this interview that I'm very intimidated by this interview because her work is just so uh, scholastic in nature. Uh, but from having talked to her just briefly, I'm sure she's going to be able to explain to all of us in, in words that we can understand uh, not only her great work, but her conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, uh, uh, Marina, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me. And uh, again, I, I, I said I'm intimidated, but in a nice way, because uh, your work is just so, uh, so impressive to me. So uh, let me ask you this. How, how, what made you get started to even think about this topic? What, what was the interest to you? Well, I've been working sort of on the effects of political frictions on the economy since my PhD dissertation back in 2004. So for a long time, I've been trying to understand how sort of this function between political parties affects uh, the economy through policies, and in particular things like investment, you know, employment, debt, et cetera. But most of what I've done before was theoretical in nature, and I think that uh, after I worked at the Fed and I started being more in contact with numbers, I started trying to ask myself, you know, how would you measure this? How would you quantify political dysfunction in a way that can be used to then try to address how it affects the economy? And that's kind of how, how uh, I ended up working on this project. So, so you were working at the Fed at the time, and what, what were you doing for the Fed? Can you tell us? Is it top secret stuff, or you can, can you tell us what you were doing? Well, I, I was at the research department, and ba what we do there is basic research. Uh, we also, you know, talk to the president about the state of the economy, but most of my work was to do basic research. And, and I was working on this uh, political macroeconomics. So you were in Philadelphia with the Fed. Were there, I don't remember, seven districts, nine districts? How many Fed districts are there? Thirteen. Thirteen, okay. So I don't know. I didn't do my homework on that one. And does each one have their own research department? Yes, yes, they all have their own research department. Because I assume at all times they're trying to make decisions for their district. So the, the Philadelphia Fed is trying to make decisions for the Philadelphia district. And, but I also would guess that they're trying to coordinate with the other districts on, on, on topical issues as well, no? Well, they, that I, I'd rather not talk too much about. Okay. That's what I said, top I secret. I don't want to get in trouble. That's right, top <laughs> secret. So you developed this fascination with um, the interaction of politics and the economy. Yes. Are there many people that are in this field? I, I don't know much about uh, what people are studying in economics. So, so it's a relatively small field, uh, but it has been growing, especially because the importance of politics, you know, has been growing lately. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some people that study interaction between policymakers, some people that study uh, politics itself, you know, the, the political process, and then some that are closer to what I do try to study interaction between that and the macroeconomy. So, so how, you know, what what happens at the decision uh, making level affects what happens at uh, the individual level. And, and I take it that because our political system in the United States has been particularly dysfunctional for the last 20 years that maybe prior to that it would not have been as hot of a topic, but it became a more hot topic as the system became more dysfunctional? Well, actually, interestingly, it, very early in the day, 
economic was politics. I mean, it, it, it was basically one and the same thing. And they started separating uh, later, uh, later on, but then, let's say, around the 50s and 60s, it started to converge again. And that actually does coincide with a period in which polarization started rising. And actually, the index that, that you've mentioned early on uh, in the show that I constructed started increasing again. So this, the, the political, the relationship of maybe political, if I understand correctly, dates back even to the 50s. And you? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not a new field. It's something that people have been studying for a while. Very interesting. So uh, how did you decide to focus specifically on your topic, which is partisan conflict, correct? Yeah, well, so I've been observing that, uh, you know, polarization had been increasing in recent years, that the government had become more and more dysfunctional in the sense that it had been more complicated to reach a decision uh, entering in, in long periods of gridlock. So I was trying to understand, you know, how can we quantify that uh, the degree of, of uh, political dysfunction or political disagreement and, uh, and try to see whether this had any effect in, for example, the fact that the Great Recession took so long to recover. So could politics have been a, a, a something that exacerbated the, the Great Recession. So, so for view, our viewers' purposes, your topic is partisan conflict, and one yes. of the issues that drives partisan conflict is polarization. I just want to clarify exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And actually, in, in my paper, you can see that if you look at the long-run behavior of partisan conflict, it is very connected to the long-run behavior of polarization. So there is a connection between the two, but it's not always one-to-one. -one. There are periods where polarization was very high, but one of the parties, for example, the Democratic Party, had control of the presidency, council, and the Senate, and we almost didn't see partisan conflict. An example of this is uh, the New Deal, you know, in the, in the early 30s. Um, right, and, that, right. and the, the Depression, from reading your paper, the Depression was such a unique event that, that it almost is an outlier to a certain extent, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. It, it, exactly, right. It's a period where it was very easy to agree on, on, uh, on policy. Other, other periods that, that look like that are, uh, for example, when there are national threats or wars, it, those tend to be periods where party and conflict is very, very small. So political scientists refer to this as a rally around the flag in the sense that, you know, parties unite uh, around a common threat and make decisions very quickly. So, so we see that in the index. That most of the low values that are observed are during periods of, you know, 9-11, for example, is another outlier. Partisan conflict is very, very low. Gotcha. So j just so I understand, when I think of someone who's, a, let's say, a scientist, they usually have a hypothesis, and then they mm -hmm. test the hypothesis to see if it's proved right or not. When you go into a project like this, do you go in thinking you're trying to prove something, or do you go in trying to collect a bunch of data and see what the data tells you? Or is there even a difference? Well, no, no, no. I have this hypothesis that politics does affect the economy. I mean, it might seem obvious to some people, but actually it's very difficult to measure uh, whether, you know, whether it affects the economy and by how much, because there are no reliable measures of political dysfunction, or there are no measures that, that uh, are computed at kind of frequency. So what I wanted to do is collect the data, compute the measure, and then try to test whether it does affect the economy or not, and by how much? You know, is it a sizable effect? Is it significant? Is it a persistent effect? So that, that's what I was, what I had in mind. So, so in order to design your particular experiment, if, if you don't mind, I'll call it an experiment. You, yeah. you, you reached out to newspapers to examine newspapers, and you set up a system to determine when they use certain keywords, and whether or not those keywords could be measured in the sense of this partisan conflict. Is that a fair representation? Yeah, so basically what I did is I, I look at the frequency of newspaper articles that are talking precisely about uh, political disagreement between either, you know, different uh, branches of the government or the, the, the Democrats and, and the Republicans. So I came up with a, a set of keywords that, you know, sort of summarize these type of articles, and then I look at their frequency over time. And I computed a measure which uh, looked at the proportion of those articles 
in total number of articles uh, in, in newspapers. And I'm basically looking at major newspapers. Uh, and, you know, and, like and the New York Times, the Washington Post. Right. And, and, and I think I've seen this before. I mean, other people have had studies off of keywords, or you even hear now that people do tweeting, and they measure how often a word is tweeted in order to determine impact. Yeah, and so the, most, the methodology I follow is similar to the one that Becker, Bloom, and Davis use when they compute the economic policy uncertainty. So they, they kind of use the same idea of, you know, let's look at uh, newspapers and let's try to see uh, a textual analysis of different news and let's try to learn and extract from information from them. No, no, one question I had for you, and I'm, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker, I just was thinking about this. Mm -hmm. You focused on a certain number of newspapers, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. In the United States, particularly going back, you know, years ago, I don't know how, how it is now, there used to be reporting services. So there used to be the Associated Press. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't always be that the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune and the LA Times would have their own reporters on an issue. They would rely on one reporter for the Associated Press giving them a story and then they might put the story out in their paper. Did you have to account for that? In other words, if someone from the Associated Press wrote a story and had these key words and it showed up in five different newspapers, did you have to account for the fact that one person's words appeared five times in your study? Well, so, so when we go, okay, so there's one thing you can do, and, and I have done here, which is if the news is very similar, it looks almost identical, that is only counted as one. Gotcha. So if it's actual same news story, it's going to be counted as one. Now, if they all had one source and they wrote five different stories with different general, you know, words in it, they would be counted five times. But if you get some say, the same story, that, that can be filtered out. There are actually many things that I, I use to try to filter out, you know, stories that don't belong, like try to get get uh, rid of news that talk about uh, other countries or news that talk about other topics. I try to narrow it, you know, to, to have a clean method of, of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, in fact, when I read your paper, I think you did a nice job of explaining that, all the filtering you had to do. I, I just didn't notice this one element of filtering. So, not, if I understand it correctly, you had a filter for similar stories, yes, so that yes, you yes, didn't you didn't count them on multiple occasions. Yes, yes. yes okay, so, so, you, yes. so you did this terrific study. How how long did it take to complete the study? A long time because it actually, you know, you start doing something and you learn as you go. So first, I thought, well, you know, how do we come up with the right set of terms? I read a lot of research, a lot of papers in political science, you know, I started computing this thing and then I realized that the press used very different words. So, you know, you ha I had to iterate trying to come up with the right number of words, trying to come up with a sufficient set of words that will summarize the story. I, ha I tried to, uh, you know, make sure that these words are used consistently over time. So if, as, as you've probably seen, I had two series, one that is goes from 1981 to 2013 monthly. But then there is another one that goes back to 1891. This is the one that has been cited in the economy. Now, for that one, you have to be very careful because words such as polarization didn't exist. I mean, if you look at the newspapers, at the frequency of just the word polarization, it's something that was invented sometimes in the 80s. It didn't appear ever in newspapers before. You have to be careful, you know, not to bias your estimate by using words that are used more frequently now than they were in the past. So I would say I started this maybe uh, late to 2012, early 2013. So it took a while. And by the way, I thought there was a very interesting tidbit in your paper where you point out that the words polarization and dysfunction really do not appear with any regularity until the 1980s. Yes, yes, yes. They, they are new words. The word gridlock, talmate, those have been there forever. But that can be, you know, changes in the language. I mean, and you see things were written in, in very different language. When, when you read news from the, you know, 1901, uh, they are kind of fine to read, actually. Okay. If you ever have some time, try to read political news from 1901. Um, they are very interesting. Actually, newspapers used to be very uh, partisan at the time, much more than now. You know, they, they would identify with one party or the other, and they would just, you know, attack the other party. Uh, so, so these are things that have changed over time, and you have to account for this. You know, actually, it's interesting. I, I have gone back and looked at a lot of that. 
Um, and, and I was doing it in conjunction with trying to understand voting patterns and why people voted more earlier. But the thing that's kind of frightening, and I'll bet you found this, is you could look at the titles of, of some of the articles from 100 years ago, and it's almost the same title now. It's as if we, we haven't grown up at all. Yeah, especially the ones that talk about gridlock and stalemate and filibusters, you know. Yes. Filibuster is an old, old word that has been used a lot. Right. Unfortunately, yes. So, so let's move ahead. So you had this great idea. You, you, you figured out a way to study it. You collected your data. And now you have this massive data. And in your paper, you then talk about the evolution of partisan conflict. So mm -hmm. why don't you, could you walk us through that a bit? What, what is the evolution of partisan conflict, and how does that tie into your theories? So basically, what, what we observe, so if we go to the very long time series, we saw that there were very high levels of partisan conflict early in the century, like 1890s to 1900s. And then it starts showing a decline in trend until maybe the first war. Remember what I said before, that this thing usually goes, goes uh, down during wars or, or national security. Threats. Right, you ra rally around the flag. Rally right. around the okay. flag. And then it fluctuates, but more or less around a constant mean, and it starts increasing again, more or less uh, near the, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and faster uh, since the 80s. And we see just a massive increase since the Great Recession since 2006, which actually way surpassed the levels that we've, we've seen early in the century. This is more or less what you see in terms of the long run trend. When you look at, you know, when you zoom in, there are other interesting patterns that you see. For example, you see that the index tends to go up whenever there is an election, particularly midterm elections. It tends to go up when, when there are some particular um, debates or particular issues that are very uh, conflictive, like, for example, during the discussion of Obamacare, the index was really high, the debt ceiling crisis, the fiscal cliff, you know, this all show very big spikes. So you had these, these long-term effects of partisan conflict, but you also write about very short-term. So, so did you find that, in a way, you had to break your study up? so that one was answering the long-term implications while the other was answering the short-term implications? Well, actually, most of, when I talk about uh, implications, I'm, I'm only looking at, uh, at things that start since 1981, because this is when I have the more reliable da data. Okay. When I split the long run versus the short run, I was trying to study what affects my measure. You know, what are the things that affect partisan conflict? And what you see is that there are some variables that affect the long-run trends. For example, polarization affects the long-run trends. But there are some other variables um, that affect more the short-run fluctuations, like you know, recessions, booms, wars. These are short-term spikes that they don't last too long. You know, they go up during the period and then down very quickly. Well, if you look at the long-run trends, you are thinking of things like polarization, or political power, or, or the share of seats that the president controls in the House, things like that. That, you know, they affect my series for longer periods of time. So what, if anything, would you say was the biggest surprise to you as you were d digesting the data? Well, actually, to me, the rally around the flag was pretty surprising. I mean, I didn't expect it to be so, you know, consistent. Like, every, you look at World War I, you look at World War II, you know, it's always much lower than anything else. I wasn't that surprised about the spike since the Great Recession because we've been reading it in the newspapers. Um, and actually, you know, I didn't know coming into this how it would correlate to other variables, but it actually correlates pretty well to things that you would expect, you know, like whether government is divided or not, whether uh, it's related to polarization. We also see that it goes basically hand in hand with uh, inequality, especially since the mid-60s. The two variables grow basically at the same rate. And there are some theories that, you know, talk about why could it be that as there's more inequality in society, parties are not converging to the middle. You know, they are trying to reach people at the same All right. As they right. say, in, in, uh, time flies when you're having fun, and we're going to start to run out of time. I have a few more questions. So mm -hmm. um, she did this great work, and you uh, did this great study. Let's talk about some of your findings in terms of the relationship of partisan conflict to the economy. That's really the crux of it, right? 
So yeah, from yeah, my yeah. viewer's perspective, what, what did you learn and, and what are the lessons, the takeaways from what you learned? So, so what I did is I tried to look at, imagine that there is a shock of uh, conflict, like the one that we've observed since the Great Recession. I tried to do a study, an econometric study, of how that would affect other things like output, employment, investment, etc. And what I found there is that if, you know, you have this increase in inequality, which was pretty large, you would see uh, effects on, uh, on investment. There would, there would be up to 9% decline in investment after four or five quarters. That effect was statistically significant, and it was very persistent. You know, it would take a long time to go back to, to trends. You would also observe effects uh, in the labor market. You would see, you know, I don't know, more than one million uh, jobs lost when politics, uh, political dysfunction increases like how we did during the Red Recession. And you would also see some impact on GDP. Uh, in terms of the government, you would see an impact on deficit. I, I didn't find much in terms of spending. Uh, so this, that's basically the biggest impact is on employment, output, and investment. Well, though, that's, big, that's, big enough right, that's big enough right there, don't you think? Sorry, sorry. I said that's big enough right there, just what you found, you know? It's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's particularly, the one that is more, I think, robust and striking is the effect on investment, because I try to do that with many econometric techniques, looking at different time horizons. I looked at it using my, you know, my finer measure, my long-run measure, and that thing seems to be pretty robust. But, you know... If there is dysfunction, there's going to be less investment. And there are theories about why this happens. And, and basically the idea is that, uh, you know, when the government, when, when you cannot predict what the government is going to do, it's very difficult for you to try to figure out what your return on investment are going to be. So to the extent that any investment that you make has some irreversibility or, or important cost, imagine you want to expand the plant, you know, it's something that will take a few years. It's going to involve a big, big cost of expanding the plant. If you don't know if, you know, uh, taxes are going to go up by 10% or down, or, sorry, up by 2% or down by 2%, you might just freeze. And that's a little bit what happened during the Great Recession. There was so much uncertainty about whether uh, politicians would be able to agree on something that, a lot of firms and households that froze and, and didn't invest for a while. And, and these things are the ones that tend to prolong recession. Mr. Marina, I, I tell you what I found interesting in, in your conclusions. It, mm -hmm. I don't think it surprised me that there was this correlation and that it would play out in the business world. But if I, if I understand your paper correctly, you're saying this actually reaches down to the household level. Well, the, the measure I, I have is aggregate, so it's including everything. So I, I, I did not separate the two of them, but now that you say that's an interesting suggestion, maybe I should look at, uh, try to separate, uh, you know, business from, from household uh, and try to look at the effect separately. But, but basically I have an aggregate measure of investment and you see that everything goes down when there is a lot of conflict. All right, so, I, so uh, thanks for explaining that, because obviously that's the one point I misunderstood in your paper. So uh, sorry about that. Um, well, you've been a terrific guest. Uh, love having you. Let me ask you, uh, I guess, one more question. What has been the reaction in your professional world to your paper? Are you getting a lot of uh, favorable comments? Have people questioned your results? How, how's that playing out professionally? So actually, people have responded very well. They're very excited. You know. I've been presenting it both in political science departments and economic departments. I've been to a few conferences uh, at the National Bureau of Economic Research that talk precisely about uh, either uncertainty or, you know, the Great Recession. So it, I think it, it, it has like a good uh, welcome in, in the profession. Now, there are some things, and, and I must be open about this, you know, whenever you do any of type of these studies, it's very difficult to, to separate what causes what. So, for example, would it be possible that the, the fact that there is a recession and the fact that there is low investment, it's causing policymakers to fight more? And these sort of reverse causalities are issues that we are always trying to address with our research. 
in the version of the paper that you've seen, I, I haven't still, uh, I haven't uh, written or explained how to deal with that, but in the next version of the paper, you know, I've, I've addressed this. And, you know, you present, people bring out comments, questions, and then uh, you make your paper better. But, but it's just a great uh, welcome in the profession. I mean, I've, I've been everywhere this year presenting it, so I've, I've got comments from the brightest and best minds in, in, in economics. Well, if you find your way out to Aspen, Colorado, we let us know and we'll do a personal interview in, uh, in the studio. Oh, that How's would that? Be great. <laughs> that well, would thank be. you very much. Uh, uh, you, even though I was intimidated coming in, there was nothing intimidated about talking to you. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. All the best. Bye-bye.